So, Dr. Max G. Hello. Yes. Hello. This Thank- always feels weird. Ma- Dr. Max G always feels really weird. I know it's a thing, but like... Saying the doctor? Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's like a... I worked really hard for this, but at the same time, I now sound like some sort of... I don't know. Yeah. It doesn't... It still hasn't quite sunk in. Hmm. Is it Max or Maxine as well? Max. Max prefer Max. Good. Yeah. Okay. Because I saw on like your lecture of profile sign-in. and everything it's maxine yeah I know. but on your twitter it's max <laughs> so i thought i'd ask yeah it's one of those things where i feel like from the academic publishing point of view i tend to use maxine mm. and full name that's the thing that's on the doctorate but any type of conversation or with filmmaking it's always max oh nice okay so filmmaking you have a separate kind of mm. entity because it feels more casual or more like a nickname type sphere that you want to (laughs) well it's a funny story about that actually so max is what pretty much everyone calls me Mm. and it also was a really good trick when i started out in the industry because i wrote things that were quite kind of large action adventure um and as producers would read my work and then invite me in for meetings they expected that i would actually be a guy really um and i had a couple of meetings like that where um, someone was looking for Max G to turn up and I've been sitting there and I was like, yeah, that, that, that's me over here in the dress. Hi. Um, <laughs> and how was that received when they realized actually you're a woman? Um, I mean, you know, it's always quite nice to have a chance to wrong foot somebody, especially when you're not in the position of power. Right. Okay. Um, and I was only 23 at the time. Yeah. yeah 23. Wow. So it was quite a, an interesting way of just kind of leveling that playing field a little bit interesting um and i think because of the thought the sort of things i wrote and still write while they are areas that are growing um in representation um for women it's not been as big a deal there haven't been as many um women in those spheres so Mm. it was kind of a way of sneaking under the radar that's interesting because i because i um my full name is thomas obviously yeah but i refer to myself as tom but also online i refer to myself as tom ron one of my middle names is ronald (laughs) (laughs) but but the problem with my name is tom stone is quite a common name right so so, you know if you search for me on google or whatever it would it would i'd be on the second or third page probably of google if as tom stone but if you search tom ron stone (laughs) then immediately yeah there they all are so it's kind of like a tool for me from that point of view as well to use a different alias kind of on social media and whatever else i think and I think it's really important, right, to think about a way of presenting yourself. It becomes part of maybe like a um, a shield or a persona or something like that, right? Mm, yeah. I struggle with that, though. Yeah? I struggle with, um, <clears throat> I don't know, making the decisions, m- knowing knowing how I come across, especially <laughs> online. I've got no idea. <laughs> well, I guess we talk all the time, don't we, about like how do you brand yourself or present yourself and mm. things, and I'm... Uh, I don't know if I do it that well either, but <laughs> it's just... Well, you've got doctor in front of your name, so that's quite a good one. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. So how did um how did the journey to becoming a doctor go for you? I mean, was it quite... You were quite young, weren't you, when you became a doctor? Um, Not that young, as in I didn't... So I didn't go straight from um sort of undergrad MA into doctorate. I took a little bit of time off in the middle. So I did my undergrad um in the UK at um, Durham University in English and um, history. So quite a different, not adjacent (laughs) sphere. Yeah, I know. Um, And then I went to America to study creative writing. And so I did a Master of Fine Arts in California at University of California, Riverside, Palm Desert Graduate Center. There's a mouthful. (laughs) Is that a full name? (laughs) Yeah, that is a full name. (laughs) Every time you write a bio and it has like your credentials, I'm like, oh, and there go 25 of my words immediately. <laughs> I'm like, please write this 75-word bio of yourself. It's like, oh, there we go. What, what was that? Say it again. What was it? At the University of California, Riverside, Palm Desert Graduate Center. <laughs> and I also, and it's a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing and Writing for the Performing Arts. Oh, that's the whole bio gone then, yeah. yeah it's gone. Um, but I did that. And what, the reason I went to the States was that I wanted to get out of the country, out of the UK, for a little bit. Um, and sort of masters of creative writing had been set up for a much longer time that particular program also was really focused on trying to get you to try different styles of writing Hmm. so I did go out there a novelist and I came back a screenwriter so (laughs) 
<laughs> so that was the change that was the spark for you over yeah there. really so I took um, a class I think it was my first or second um sort of semester of being out there um in screenwriting I'd never read a screenplay before um I loved film I loved television but at that point in time it wasn't quite as easy to access screenplays as it is now so I didn't know what they looked like how you would structure one how you put one together I knew what a novel looked like mm. because I had read a lot of them mm. <laughs> um but that was something that I really got into thinking about and so I tried a class I seemed to have a a strong kind of affinity for that medium um and after a couple of classes the um, teachers who were out there were all like I think maybe you want to switch your major and that might be a thing you do and I was like yeah that sounds great and you never look back Mm, still, uh, <laughs> you're looking back still today yeah, yeah. i still write prose um, right. occasionally mm. um once a year definitely i've got a couple of friends back in new york and we write a ghost story every christmas as a sort of ghost story tradition mm. um so one once a year prose at <laughs> least um but no i love screenwriting um and the sort of collaborative nature of it and the potential for it so mm. yeah still really enjoying that so went out there did that um got an agent immediately as I finished so then worked out of LA for um a couple of years in development mostly so mm. working on um adaptations of young adult um novels and things like that so I wrote young ad I wrote action adventure at that point <laughs> <laughs> um yeah uh, the kind of Indiana Jonesy, oh, really? sort of big adventure. You know, people going off to find MacGuffin type things in places. Something so, you need like a hundred million pounds to make a decent film of. Yeah, so you know when they're like, "We really enjoy your script. Your, you know, this is a wonderful Collins card script, but you know, as a twenty-three-year-old, no one's making that movie. What it's acting for is um, proving that I can do the job." Mm. And that then got me kind of in with lots of different producers to talk about projects where they had the rights to books and they were looking for someone to adapt. So I worked in the sort of early end development of that for a while, mm. which was really good. Um, and then my agent died oh. and I was back in the UK at that point. Um, and I sort of wanted to try s something with a bit more stability, which anyone who's in academia is laughing at now and thinking that academia has stability, but it does compared to the film industry. Mm. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, I've never really properly worked in the film industry, <laughs> but I get the gist, yeah. Um, so at that point, um, I was doing a little bit of work in theatre. I was working, teaching at an after-school after creative writing. Um, and I met someone who was doing a PhD by practice, mm. which was something I had never heard of. I didn't know that it existed. Um, she was doing hers in playwriting. Um, and we got talking and I then ended up having a conversation with some lecturers at the um, University of York um, about what would a practice PhD in screenwriting look like because that's something that it would offer um, and and then that's how I got into doing that so you just sort of a chance encounter with somebody talking about this made me go actually yeah, I really want to kind of look at the craft a bit more um, and I wanted to look more at science fiction and um, so that's how I got into that <laughs> sort of um, and then <coughs> there was a funding stream coming online so that made it possible otherwise I don't think I could have afforded to do it hmm. um so I so I then started this PhD which was in screenwriting um looking at science fiction I looked at um sort of science fiction and film noir around the post-human so robots clones AI everything that's kind of cool and catchy right now <laughs> um and this was how, how many years ago oh that was so I started that in 2014 okay so between so finishing my started. Oh gosh, I know, yeah. Finishing the masters in twenty I'm not doing the math. Twenty ten. Um and starting the PhD there were four years. Okay. So yeah. four years of freelancing. <coughs> hmm. How was that freelance world? What what was it like sitting in meetings with producers and trying to get scripts kind of commissioned? Is that the right word? Yeah. 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 So I was I had a really good had some good experience I think with it. Um a lot of it, like I said, was in LA, so with various um, production companies and sort of at Paramount, Disney, um, which all sounds really cool now. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> what was I doing there? <laughs> um, and I had, a, I had a good time, but I think my agent, Karen, was really fantastic at putting me in front of people who um, were not going to take advantage of me too much. Right. 
Um, and I think with all of the kind of the me too things that have come out about Hollywood, mm. um, I feel, and I sh wish I didn't feel I could say that I'm incredibly lucky that I never had any of those experiences um, as a young woman mm. um, going to all of these meetings on my own. Um, but yeah, I never experienced any of that, which is great. So you were literally going to these meetings by yourself yeah. as a 23 year old. You yes. Say? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I thought oh she would. God. I thought my agent would come with me. I thought Karen was going to be there, and she's like, "No, no, no, this is not what happens." I'm like, "Wait, wait, 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 wait what?" Um, and I do have a really distinct memory of the first one was um, at one of the, it was a production company that had done the Predator movies at some point, so they had this giant statue of the Predator, mm. and it was across from where you sat in the waiting room. This thing's like looming. Um, and I was sitting there like, oh, god. <laughs> Your imagination's sort of running wild, probably. <laughs> <laughs> this is what the um, meeting's going to be like. Yeah, and that, I mean, that was a really good, that was a really good session. Um, and yeah, so you, it was, so a lot, like I said, a lot of it was taking meetings with people who went, your script is really good, yep. Um, do <clears> you know this book? And I'd be like, no, I don't. Um, but I can tell you what I, how I would adapt it. Um, give me a week. So I'd then go to... Um, Barnes and Noble borders, borders was still a thing at that point, <laughs> and grab the book, mm. um, and then s read it. Work out how it could be adapted. Work out the things that were really visual about the novel, the through line, the things that don't work, um, and then try and kind of come up with a pitch for that. And then I'd All have right. them meeting a week or so later and be like, okay, so this is how I would work on this text. Um, and some of them I was lucky with, and some of them not. Um, so I did a lot of that. Um, continued my own writing. And, um, and then I lived in the, in the UK and sort of went out for a month at various periods to do meetings because it just worked out a little bit cheaper. <laughs> right. Um, and then while I was in, um, York, there was a huge boom in the sort of filmmaking community in York as there still is. Mm. Um, and people were kind of coalescing. And so I got involved with some of the filmmakers who were there as well and did some commercials and things like that. Hmm, fantastic. So were you, was it cheap? Were you staying with your parents in York? Yes, I was. Yeah, you didn't want to say that. Sorry. No, I don't mind. Um, <laughs> no, I stayed with my parents, which meant that I didn't have to pay. No, for that's, that's like, it's good rent. to take advantage of that while you can, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Probably good advice to students listening. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. Um, if you do have a good relationship with your yeah. parents, um, no, that was actually really, really helpful. Especially um, if you're trying to make it in freelance world, I guess. Yeah, because yeah, freelancing is. Uh, it can either go really well and you have periods where everything is fantastic and you're so busy and then there are periods where you're doing nothing at all. Mm. Um, and if you're doing a lot of work on spec, so if you're writing scripts without um, a particular commission in mind, then you're not getting any money for that. But you do need to continue to be writing. Right. So you, which is basically what happened with you, right? You were writing and that was then your calling card for them to trust yeah. you to do a book adaptation, for example. Yeah. And did any of those get made in the end as films? No, they didn't, which but is the really, really sad part about um, sort of the <laughs> film industry is that there are so many projects being developed at any point. Mm. Um, yeah. Some stuff got kind of close and then no. Nope. But that's the that's the reality of it, right? It really is, yeah. Mm. Um, mm. But I do still really enjoy film. I love TV and I love thinking about ideas for TV. Um but I also just like that kind of one-off thing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I'm with you on that. Yeah. <laughs> it's contained and you've finished the story yeah. for those characters. Yeah, and you've polished it as much as it possibly can be. And it's, yeah. A TV feels more throwaway to me sometimes. <sighs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Especially also, you have to... So at the time when I was thinking about this and doing this back in um, the early... Well, the mid-2010s. Sounds very weird. Um... <laughs> that television in the States was still very much a sort of 22 episode season. Mm -hmm. Whereas opposed to what I'd grown up on in the UK, which had been six episodes, <laughs> maybe eight if you were lucky. Right. Um, and thinking about writing something that's 22 episodes long <laughs> is, um, is cool and incredible, but also like there's so much content. That's why there are so many different writers involved in that. Mm. Um, and in that kind of idea of the writer's room and lots of people being involved in it, which we have more of in the UK <coughs> now than we used to mm. um, as things evolve. And then with the streamers coming, we've shifted the sort of length of ep like how many episodes are in a season. So you, now with Netflix, with Prime, Apple, Disney, 
Sky. I'm trying to think if there's anything else out there. <laughs> Everything is kind of homo- has other streaming of- sites are available. <laughs> they are. <laughs> um, but it seems to have got into a sort of eight to ten episode right. space now. Mm, okay. Um, and what do you think of this idea that um, you you have more space to develop characters in a TV series? Does that not appeal to you? It is appealing, um, and I do like that. I think I just like a contained story. Hmm. Um, and I'm saying that because I'm currently working on a project with a friend in the States that is a television show. <laughs> so you're being careful what you say. <laughs> um, no. Um, I th- I'm going to be honest. I will write for whatever medium comes yeah. along um, <laughs> because each one comes with its own sort of joy and challenges. Hmm. Um, I think that just sometimes the way... I think about a concept tends to lend itself quite nicely to a two hour sort of time period. Like, okay, things have been resolved. Things have been worked out. There has been growth and development or there Mm. hasn't. Um, It's horror. Mm. (laughs) So (laughs) awful things have happened. (laughs) Um, To good people. To good people and bad people. (laughs) Um, And, and, and whatever. Yeah. So that, that's kind of, that's sort of how that's evolved mm. a little bit. Um, by backtrack, didn't I? Yeah. On the topic of your films, you've 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 made th- uh, what is it? Three short films? Two short films? Two short films and a web series. Web series, yeah, that's right. Um, so that filmmaking community in New York, um, as I said, is is really fantastic, and um, that was something that I got involved with, and I had been actually doing some theatre work. Um, so I did a, a an adaptation of um, uh, Sherlock Holmes of a Sherlock Holmes story, um, the Speckled Band. I don't know if you know it. It's the one with the snake. No, I'm not that familiar with it. I'm it's afraid. So fantastic. Um, but I did a, a full length theatre production adaptation for a site specific theatre, so theatre that's not in a traditional theatre space. Okay. We were in the Treasurer's House, so a heritage building in York. Oh wow. Yeah, it was really good. It had good atmosphere. Mm. Um, and a lot of people who had been involved with that were also involved in film and filmmaking in York. And we ended up making a web series with a few folks from there, um, Tales of Bacon, which is a sort of Monty Python and the Holy Grail, um, Maid, Mary, Maid Marian and Her Merry Men, if you remember that TV show, yeah. kind <laughs> of a vibe. It's very low budget. It's very, um, yeah, rough around the edges, sort yeah. of comedy about a partner. So those are the people who travelled around selling you pardons for your sins. <laughs> so bits of paper that pardon you for doing various things or various bits of dead body as bits of saintly dead body. Were they real people? Yeah, real people. Really? It's, a, it's a real thing. Wow. Um, we had a lot of fun looking up the various relics that were are out there. Um, such as, you know, the plate that held the head of John the Baptist or... Milk from the breast of the Virgin Mary is a thing. Um, <laughs> and figuring out how we could incorporate all of those things into this web series. History is so bizarre. <laughs> it's really fantastic. Um, and because we were based in York, which is a, a city with a lot of history, mm. um, it was quite, it wasn't easy, but there are a lot of options for filming things that are historic. Mm. And we hadn't seen it done, so we thought, why not? And then we realised, why not? <laughs> <laughs> so we made it. Um, but Natalie Rowe, who was the director, is really, really fantastic um, for kind of managing to find all sorts of things for very little money whatsoever <laughs> and putting this together. Um, but it involved a lot of the people from the film community. Right. And that kind of then spread into us doing all sorts of other projects. Mm. Um, and then there was Terminal, mm-hmm. which um, was part of my PhD. So I wrote a short... Um, I wrote three scripts for the PhD and Terminal um, was the first. It was a short. um, I didn't realize that was part of your PhD. Mm, Yeah. Mm, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Um, Just sort of setting up some of the ideas of things I was exploring with Mm. the use of film noir um, aesthetics, but narrative structures, this idea of, you know, being able to tell a story like a con man perhaps and how stories are tied into human nature and maybe a defining feature of what it means to be human is to tell stories and to construct narratives. And when characters who aren't traditionally human, genetically, you know, but suddenly learn the ability to lie, to tell stories, we see them um, perhaps sometimes in a more positive light within these, within these narratives, they become almost human mm. or more human than human if you want to quote Blade Runner, which, <laughs> you know, I always want to do. <laughs> um, 
but sort of terminal came out of that um and that's a, a future where everyone is um physically reconfigured for jobs so jobs remain um stereotypically gendered but the human body is shifted per job so you will go into the job center and be completely physically refigured um every time and sort of looking at what that means and if that's a world that removes any kind of familial connections what happens if people fall in love and they want to stay together <laughs> um and they don't mind that they're reconfigured physically but when one of them is sick and they're not allowed to be with that person when they die like what would you do to kind of in engineer a way of being with the person you love when they're about to die mm. is the sort of question at the heart of that short um, and I worked with a fantastic team at Row Pictures, um, Cal O'Connell as the director right. um, for that. There's a lot of um, CGI in that one, isn't there? There is quite a lot. Yeah, CGI Cal actually and things, taught himself there? all of that. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, for that film? For that film, yeah. That's impressive. Yeah, he, he's really incredible. Mm. Um, so he taught himself all of that because we had some folks involved and then things dropped as they always do. Um, and you know, money was getting a little tight and he was like, actually, I think I can learn how to do this. And he did. Wow. And it turned out all right. Yeah. I thought it was a good, yeah. 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 Um, Very impressive. So is this all from this filmmaking community in York? Yeah. And, and how did this community come about? How did it? Um, I'm not entirely sure what the kind of perfect storm of, so both universities at York teach, um, film. And for some reason, folks stay around. It's a lovely city. There's a, I think there's a, quite a lot of jobs there outside of the industry, but there's quite a lot of jobs mm. um, that encourage a sort of staying in the area. And a lot of folks were working at the cinemas and I think they just got talking and they were making shorts and people started making shorts together. And then we kind of all coalesced into the York Filmmakers Coalition. <laughs> Um, which was, became a sort of Facebook group, a <laughs> focal point. Um, I used to run the Ox Screenwriters Guild, so we used to meet and critique and give feedback on scripts every couple of weeks in a pub. Um, and that kind of continued, so people were bringing things that they were then going off and making, um, and it sort of created that real energy. Yeah, you need that, I think, don't you? You need yeah. a team to be able to do anything in filmmaking, really. Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> it's very hard work doing things by yourself. We kept losing sound recordists. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> you know, sound record we were all like, sound recordists are like gold dust. They were all getting mm. jobs and actual jobs within the industry, mm. which is fantastic. Yeah. But also, no. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think most people probably who get into filmmaking do it for the visual side of things. So I, I find that there's probably less sound recordists in film. Yeah, probably. Maybe. I I don't know. Do you think? No? Maybe? I don't know, actually. <laughs> it seems like anyone who wants to be a sound recordist from the classes I teach gets work pretty pretty yeah. quickly after university. Yeah, they really Compared do. to the visual people who struggle for... Because <laughs> there's so many people who want to be cinematographers or directors. <laughs> yep, it's I think. true. Maybe it's more of a, an ego-chasing thing, that kind of thing as well. Di being a director is kind of... <clears throat> massaging your own ego a bit isn't it <laughs> this is my With film some directors <laughs> <laughs> gonna be really careful around that um so yeah uh, so terminal terminal won some awards as well did it not yes I we believe. did we um won best short film at the starburst international film festival so run by starburst magazine which is a sort of yeah science fiction <laughs> not the sweets not the sweets unfortunately <laughs> not um which is a kind of um I would say science fiction, sp other speculative fiction sort of um, magazine. It's been mm. going for quite a while um, out of Manchester. Oh, right. Um, and which was really nice because the film is set in a future Manchester. <laughs> so we were like, yeah, this is great. Um, yes, we d I didn't want to write something that was set in a future London, but to have somewhere that was northern as well. Um, and had planned all sorts of disastrous things that would happen to the south of England. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to kind of make that work. Right. What's the nice, the interesting thing about writing science fiction is thinking about the logical timeline. Okay. So what of how things would progress to that point? Yeah. And then putting in a logical timeline and then watching the events of the world slowly re create your timeline and go... <laughs> <laughs> I feel like maybe that's a nod to AI because I know you're interested in artificial intelligence as well, right? Yes. So I feel like we're going down one of those paths probably that you've imagined 10 years ago with AI right now. 
<laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I want to talk about your latest yes. film, by the way, soon, but I don't know whether to branch to AI now or talk about this. <laughs> we can talk about AI. Go on, um, talk about AI, because yeah, I love that subject. Okay, so, yeah, actually, it's been really fun to work with. Um, I did a research project last summer with um, some people who I had done my PhD in the same uh, around the same time. Um, but their subjects are very different. So uh, Imke van Heerden did her PhD in English um, and Anil Bath um, in computer science. Mm. And they're both now based in Turkey. They're a married couple. <laughs> um, oh. And they were looking at um, artificial intelligence and text generation for poetry. Okay. Um, and their book that has just been published is the first book of poetry AI and human collaborative poetry in Afrikaans. Um, Imka is from South Africa. Oh, that makes sense. I was going to say, where's the link there? Yeah. And so um, they've just done that project and they got in touch with me because Imka remembered that I was really interested in AI okay. with my PhD. So I'd written about kind of did science you, fiction. Did you know them previously? So I'd known them from the PhD. I see. Um, and we had, um, we, Imka and I had desks in a similar work area. Right. So we'd made friends and we'd sort of kept in touch. Mm. And she said, oh, do you want to write a screenplay with an AI? And I was like, yeah, that sounds amazing. Let's do that. <laughs> um, so we worked on developing um, the software a little bit, which I don't know a lot about, to be honest. Um, but that was fed with quite, I think it's the chat GPT-2 was the model. Um, we're on four, are we now? Five? We're on four now. Four, yeah. Um, was part of the modeling for that mm. and they created and sort of their own data set of all the sort of screenplays that are freely available online and we fed the um the algorithm with all of that information um and then i just spent a few days with them on zoom and kind of via email sending in sections of script so i'd write a section and then they'd feed that into the algorithm and it would give me about 30 different options of the next set of the script. Right. Um, Rain, in terms of, would you tell it roughly what direction you wanted it to go in or just the, f the first bit and then it would yeah, extrapolate so it was kind from of there? Yeah, extrapolating and... its own choice of things. Mm. Um, and that was part of the process. So we were really interested in the weirdness of it. So not trying to make it feel perfectly like a human was writing something, mm. but to have that as a kind of... Um, an inspiration, a way of opening your mind beyond the way I think about language, which is what it did. Um, <laughs> and you can um, change the temperature, they call it, of how, um, I guess, normal the responses are for it to be kind of... The scale do you want things wanted weirder <laughs> or, right. or more dull and boring? <clears throat> and that, that also is really fascinating. Mm. Um, and we've got this short script that's come out of it, which is really nice. Um, it's not what I thought the script would be when I started writing it, which <laughs> is great. <laughs> like working with any human collaborator, it's the same thing. You know, you put something in and that's two minds thinking about things and then you something different comes out of the middle. Mm. Um, and it made me think about language slightly differently, which is always fun when language is your thing. <laughs> um and it's this really cute little shot. And we're hoping, we presented it at the Screenwriting Research Network last year um, at the annual conference. Um, we had a few actors reading out the script as part of that. And that was really neat. Nice. Um, and maybe the, the hope is we'll get to make it because I'd quite like to do a project as a research project of seeing where we could bring AI collaboration into other aspects of the filmmaking process. Mm. How do you feel about AI in that respect? Bex. I'm not terrified of it taking my job. Let's put it that way. That was pretty much the question. <laughs> I was just I was, that was the gist of the question I was trying to get out. Yeah, yeah, I think everyone is quite concerned, but we've been using things that are um, sort of we've used sort of types of algorithm already. Do you use spell check on your computer? Yeah. Do you use predictive text? <laughs> um, yes, on my phone. You mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, when you type into Google and it suggests to you, mm. like, the question you were trying to answer. Do you answer, click on the thing or do you, you click on typing? The, yeah, right. So mm. there are certain aspects of this that we have already invited into our lives. So parts of it are like that. I think, obviously, the fear is that this is something that will be able to generate work faster. And it does work 
very quickly. Um, I was experimenting with Bard, which mm. is Google's equivalent of the chat GPT uh, the week, last week. And that that's terrifyingly quick mm. with how, and it provides you drafts and things like that. But it also lies quite spectacularly. <laughs> um, I asked but, it to but, write a bio <laughs> of me and it made up a book that I'd written two years ago. I was like, in an alternative universe, yes, I would love to have written this book, but this book does not exist. <laughs> I've got the public what the publisher should be the year what it looked right. did it did it use up 50 words on the california <laughs> no, it did what not was it riverside <laughs> <laughs> but it was um yeah so i think because there's a lot of panic around that well i to, to me i mean i think i probably do err on this or land on the side of slightly worried probably yeah more than maybe some I just, I just what think are you this is the be- about? I think this is just the beginning. Well, I, I don't know if it's con- it's probably more concern about not knowing the the unknown because I think I I think this is the very start really of AI, isn't it? This is the, yeah. It's a it's a baby at the moment, <clears throat> and it's amazing already. So, in twenty years' time, I can't imagine that. <clears throat> um. I just, I just I just imagine it could probably write no- novels better than most authors. I mean, I had a conversation actually with our colleague Gary Hayton, who I yeah. know you're fond of as well. Um, <laughs> I have lots of interesting conversations with Gary in the office. I miss sharing an office with Gary. Oh, I got him now. <laughs> um, he was basically he basically said though that it's the it's the human experiences that are going into these stories that make them worth yeah. listening to. But but I I still think though. Robots are basically learning to mimic humans, right? So, so eventually, whether it really came from a human or not will be irrelevant because they would just mimic what we can do so well. That's surely the, the logical <clears throat> ending to this. I guess that's what science... I mean, this is what science fiction is priming us for. Mm. So, so much science fiction around artificial intelligence has that kind of... The attempt to emulate the human. And, mm. it's, and you know, we're, I mean, we're writing stories actually for humans, aren't we? With cautionary tales about how human <coughs> beings behave, but using the kind of format of AIs or aliens or whatever. But actually, we're talking about very human problems. Mm. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm interested to see an artificially intelligent novel written not for humans. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know, would it even be in a in a recognizable language if it? <laughs> and does it have to be for humans? <laughs> well, I think the, the only thing is that, <laughs> but at the is, moment, is the humans that are interpreting anything as that because yeah. you could argue the paint on that wall is actually a story written for paint. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, there's also yeah. You ask you, you, the question is where is sentience and where is <laughs> awareness? Um, and at the moment, yes, we are making. Um, these algorithms to engage with humans and to mm. in- create stories, <coughs> but they are still requiring kind of human input. I don't yeah. think we're quite at that stage where there is no human input. No, I'm, I, but, but also I would say I'm not worried for the now. I'm worried for the 10, 15, 20 years when I'll hopefully still be alive <laughs> <laughs> and my children will grow up and they'll live in a world that maybe, I don't know. It's, I don't know. I, I, haven't, I can't, imagine, can't predict I think, it very clearly. I think there's that thing of, is it going to be <coughs> Skynet? Is it going to be, <laughs> you know, are we what, having the future of the Terminator? Or what's the one where the, the rich people live on an island above everyone else? Is that Elysium? Yeah, Elysium. Elysium. Yeah. <laughs> um, is it Blade Runner? Is it? <laughs> because, I mean, to be honest, I, I feel like maybe we could argue that social media was already a big step in the wrong direction. Like, there's some good things with social media. I suppose, that, like any of these things, it's a tool that can be good, used for good, but can also be quite detrimental. But I think, yeah, it's about the it's the <coughs> use of the tool, isn't it? That's the thing. At the moment, yeah. these AI um, text generators are a tool. Mm. And people are using them um, for good, perhaps for inspiration, for thinking about things a little bit differently. They're also using them nefariously for trying to cheat on various things. But as I said, if you're trying to cheat on an essay with that GPT, it's going to make up half of your references. <laughs> but um, I also, that's, that's actually one of the things I don't really care about because I personally think if you cheat at anything, you're just cheating yourself because unless your purpose of going to university is for a certificate, yeah, in which, which probably is actually the case for a lot of students. <laughs> but for me, when I went to university, it was to learn as much as possible. So, you know, if someone's doing the work for me, I'm not learning what I should be learning from doing that work. Yeah. If the assignments are designed in such a way that they help you to learn something. 
then, that's then the you're point. cheating yourself. Yeah. So, but I know a lot of people just come. They want. They probably just want a degree and they want to get out of it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I know. Yeah, you're right. I never really understand the kind of purpose behind cheating that because you're right. You only cheat yourself. You're not learning the things you need to be. Mm. Um. But at the moment, that's all that you know. That isn't really doing that task. Um. So you're not at all worried for the future. I mean, future I am a little bit. Because uh, <laughs> I'm not, not worried, especially as a sci-fi a... writer, I thought you'd <laughs> your imagination. You 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 should know exactly what's going to happen in ten to twenty years. You you're literally writing what's going to happen. Surely, <laughs> if we make, I think I'm worried if we make AI in the way that we have written stories about it. Because I think then inevitably, potentially, it will lead to bad things. But I don't know if it has to. Mm. Um, I guess I like the excitement and the possibility of it. Um, I don't know if it has to be awful, but humans are programming it. So at some point, one wonders if it will, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> but I think also from a, a creativity point of view, there's also so much ethics to be involved now. What I really like about Imka's project and what we were doing was how transparent we were. So that script is, you know, we're very open about it. This was written with AI and it was a collaboration. So here I have a version and it has the text in, I think, in red that's written by the AI. The text in black is written by me. Mm. So it's very open and honest about it. The thing that I think a lot of people are quite concerned about at the moment, rightly so, is the sort of ethics behind some of the more, um, the visual side of this. So mm. use Mid Journey and Dali, um, and kind of the sort of um, use of other people's work online. So that mining of visual data that's coming back and people are saying, well, that's from my work, but I haven't been credited for this. But that's interesting because you, that's the exact same way that the text-based stuff was taught. Yeah. But it's and harder to claim ownership over a style of writing, maybe, compared to a style of, of illustration or imagery, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think there are lawyers who will have a conversation about that. Um, but I think, yeah, it is at the moment that mimicking. Hmm. Um, and what it's doing, to some extent, is not that different from how our, how humans Well, learn. I was about to say the same thing, yeah. Right, we learn through mimicking the things that we like. And we all have a life full of references that we use when we create art. Um, it's just that that is at such a grand scale and I guess maybe because the humans aren't as involved in certain ways that it becomes quite problematic. I'm not sure. This is the <laughs> stuff I find really fascinating at the moment. I'm loving this. I'm <laughs> really enjoying the kind of proliferation of all of this information mm. and all these different um, algorithmic generators mm. and thinking about the idea of like, is this artificial intelligence is this actually intelligence? What mm. does intelligence mean? I had a great yeah. conversation last week around, um, I'm going to get this wrong, crystal and fluid intelligence from a psychological point of view and what that might mean. So this idea of um, intelligence that can kind of put random things together and make patterns, intelligence that can like learn things. So the difference between like that sort of IQ test type information and whatnot, and I'm sorry for everyone out there who's now going, mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> But there are, you know, in those terms, this these algorithmic generators are intelligent. But then I feel like we always bring some level of consciousness or self-awareness yeah. or agency into that mix, mm. especially when we're thinking about science fiction. I'm going to pull it back to sci-fi um, <laughs> because awareness and agency is that defining thing that we start to feel with the characters that aren't human, that are post-human, that are become that we see as more becoming human or human-like. Um, whether through expression of story or emotional awareness. Um, and there's a whole interesting problematic thing there, mm. especially around um, neurodivergence, which I've been doing some research with Dr. Rachel Mosley here. Um, he's a principal academic in psychology. Um, we did a theatre piece, like in a bit of interactive theatre no, really? in November. Um, funded by the ESRC mm. to look at um, autism. What was the ESRC? Sorry, the um, Economic <laughs> and Social Sciences Research Council. I think. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Do call me on all of these. Um, Lots of acronyms in the world of research, oh, isn't there? <laughs> so many. And um, so we we did a, a an afternoon where we invited members of the public in to um, talk to two actors. We took them to the future to meet future students. And one student was 
a robot and one student is human and they had a little set of questions they could ask. So sort of learned responses for the actors, not making it completely open and improvised mm. um, to figure out which one was human or not. Oh, wow. Um, which was really exciting. Mm. Um, and at the end of that, what we <coughs> revealed our kind of twist on this was that both were performing types of autistic behavior. So one very stereotypical kind of robotic, that sort of Sheldon Cooper-esque style of um, what media represents as autism. Right. And one that was much more kind of nuanced in the um, camouflaging behavior of someone who um, is not... I was going to say, who is trying to replicate um, sort of neurotypical behaviors, mm. which is quite damaging as a um, behavioral pattern for people with autism. What, what is, sorry? That, uh, that kind of camouflaging and masking. Oh, so I see, trying right. to perform all the time. Mm. Um, and has you know, there are studies around sort of mental health with that. And how science fiction does kind of present one type of human, that sort of, Hetero, that sorry that neurotypical human um emotional presentation so the right. way we re we represent what it is to be human hmm. so when robots suddenly learn to have these emotions and present emotions in a certain way that is saying that is the way of being human in the future hmm. um and that's not the way that every human is that's quite um sort of a narrow sort of slice of the spectrum of what human is so we were looking at challenging the way media presents human <laughs> and also the way media presents <coughs> autism mm. um, and getting folks just to think a little bit differently. So that's a project we'd looked at last year. Um, how did I get there? <laughs> and where did you do that, sorry? Um, so that was, that, at, was in that was in Bournemouth at oh, in the Bournemouth. public library, the central library in Bournemouth. Okay. And lots of people were in attendance there? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So it's, you do such a varied... <laughs> <laughs> array of work what what motivates you to to do all this as well what's the kind of driving force behind what you do have do you ever consider do you ever stop and think why do i do all these things <laughs> um i like to i mean the sort of central explorations are around that what is it to be human hmm. um and i like to find ways of getting people to think about what we've been presented so I think why I'm so challenging of the AI narratives that we're seeing at the moment are that they are so doom and gloom. This is the end. Our jobs will be taken. This is the thing. <laughs> and it's sort of like, well, actually, let's take a step back. Let's see what this is. It would actually be really nice if all of our jobs got taken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think also somehow, like, I, I wouldn't think about this because, you know, you know, these technologies come along that are supposed to make our lives easier. So email, for example, is one. <laughs> uh, and then and then uh, I think I think another one was, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, uh, cash points uh, at some point in time people were really worried cash points were going to completely obliterate like all cashiers and banks and stuff but actually humans always just find a way to maintain the level of output across things so if before email there was a certain amount of work we could do without having the email stuff we'd have to go and talk to people yes. that's how hard we can all work email comes along and makes the tasks easier or faster but we just continue the level of hard working. So we do more instead. So the same thing with AI, though. People say, oh, it would take our jobs. We could just relax and do creative things that we love. But we'll just find a way to push ourselves harder because now we've got this new tool that enables more and more work, more and more output all the time. That's how I think. I, I feel like technology does that. It, that's the sort of pattern of... Yeah, it's not that utopian ideal, is it? Yeah, well, oh, but I email, feel... you know, uh, now I can just send three emails rather than walking three pl places, which will save me half an hour a day. I can just sit down for half an hour. It's, no, 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 no. You just send more emails now. <laughs> it's true. Um, I think you're right in seeing that pattern. Um, and I think uh, this is a sort of societal structure problem, isn't it? Though? Yes. Well, it's the capitalism <laughs> thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, the need for more all the time. Um, and that level of productivity. <coughs> yeah. The usefulness to society is defined by productivity. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is the function of, I mean, it's the sort of underpinning thing of a lot of science fiction of thinking about what are dystopias and utopias. Um, the like positive views of the future and negative views of the future. What would be a way of thinking and living different, of, of structuring society differently. Mm. Um. And for all my l positive outlook, I tend to write dystopias, which are <laughs> awful, awful futures. 
Um, as I said, I also, you know, focus on writing horror, which is also <laughs> fatalistic and and awful. Um, you, can you can you think of why you lean towards that stuff? I have no idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> is it just because you're sick and sadistic inside? And <laughs> it's true. This is a true thing. <laughs> you like to punish your characters. <laughs> Not unnecessarily. <laughs> it's their own fault. You see, their motivations and their life choices have led them to this stage. And are they all created by me? Yes. But <laughs> now, um, I think that I'm interested in seeing the sort of extremes of various types of behavior um, and therefore seeing the things within society and noticing. I think that's what a lot of speculative fiction, whether that's um, fantastical or futuristic or um, more on that kind of horror end, are looking at kind of those um, those sort of urges and um, ways of being and looking at like, well, what happens if you take them to an extreme or to a logical extension? Mm. Or what happens if we see things... Um, if we remove morality from the equation or something kind of gets skewed within the society that allows for things to shift onto a different path. <laughs> I think the thought experiment is really fascinating. I don't mm. want to ever live in any of the features that I have created. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the things you write are the manifestation of the thought experiments, yeah. essentially. Right. Yeah, so it is much, it's really a kind of thought experiment, a mm. way of kind of working through um, a problem within the world. I think a lot of really interesting um, fiction of all kinds does that. It works through kind of whether that's a, a character thing or mm. a thing with a group or a community. Or yeah, I think often I often wonder if stories are um, kind of often warnings. You know, like fa fables. Yeah, they have a, 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 a warning to the curious <laughs> not to go off and do this thing. Yeah, I think <coughs> there's a lot of kind of I think that. I mean, the Science best the best portion. films you f you feel like you you've learned something at the end of it, don't you? Maybe about yourself or or how to be or whatever. And I think probably it's especially generations now they probably learn how to be, how to be, how to <laughs> you know um, just yeah communicate with people by watching films and seeing what happens with two characters do these things and something goes wrong and how they rectify that situation there's also something around empathy isn't there about being able mm -hmm. to put yourself in someone else's shoes that mm. fiction of all kinds does that allows mm. you to kind of see a different perspective be placed in a different perspective that one would hope allows for people to feel a little bit more empathetic about the world around them um, yeah. that is not always the case <laughs> <laughs> as history shows us again and again <laughs> and the news tells us every single day right mm. um but also there is something in an entertainment and an escape. Um, so I don't think we should ever sort of also downplay narratives that are also just there to take you out of your normal world. Yeah. Um, and that are a bit enjoyable and they might just be silly or fun. Mm. Although I had argued there's probably still something of a message even within those. <laughs> about Probably. Yeah. <laughs> but. You know, I think we get into that thing of, you know, you can only look at or be interested in things that aren't like the big blockbusters and things like that. Mm. Um, but I do still enjoy a good blockbuster movie. <laughs> um, so do all of your, do, do, any, do, do any of your stories ever have sort of utopian <laughs> finales or anything? <laughs> It'd be interesting if, now that we, you know, no. to, try, to try to, to try to do that. The AI generated one is a very positive story. Because <laughs> the AI is trying to trick us all into thinking it's a nice friendly. <laughs> Which also proves that I did this properly and collaboratively because it didn't end in death and destruction. <laughs> um, uh, I, I noticed that you've, um, you were very careful not to always say AI as we've been talking. You often use the word algorithms instead. So that comes back to what we call intelligence, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, because I, I do feel at the moment we're using a lot of terminology interchangeably yeah i see i see the term ai oh 20 new softwares have been built this week using ai but it's probably mostly algorithm based isn't it i think so because uh, like you say how can at what point do you think ai will become or you know uh -huh. will become intelligent how can we ever distinguish that and it's that kind of i think it's that thing around agency isn't it that thing of, uh, of it's self-generating it decides what 
the thing it wants to do. It has a motivation. Yeah. We can sort of give it a motivation, can't we? But it's still someone giving but it the we're motivation. Giving it a motivation. There's some, I mean, and there's some really fascinating, interesting stuff around like building bias humans. into this <laughs> and people and keeping those out of the equation. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think. I mean, what gives us our motivation? I mean, like I, like I said to you earlier, why do you do this stuff? Because I've often questioned, why am I doing this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> why do you think the things? If I was an AI, would I have decided to do this <laughs> podcast? Because it's not. I don't know. <laughs> Does it, you know, does things do things have to be productive? Do they have to have that? Yeah. I mean, we've all got a drive. <laughs> we have a drive to kind of share ideas but and to offer warnings and things like that. And I mm. do think that that is that it's that kind of self motivation, <coughs> mm. perhaps that and distinguishes do, it. And do you think because you know, there's the um, what is it? Is it um, what's that hierarchy of needs thing? That model that people yeah. spout about. So do you think our ultimate our ultimate need is just to survive and then it's the you know <laughs> it's it's basically the avoidance of pain isn't it is what drives us so to to not be hungry to not be thirsty to have shelter those things first of all and then once you've got them you can sort of start thinking about other things that might drive you but ultimately it's all about survival survival maybe i don't know it doesn't feel like doing this podcast is <laughs> anything to do with survival <laughs> <laughs> but maybe it is in some sort of I don't know I don't know <laughs> I mean I'm thinking about the kind of motivations of characters especially in all of that kind of dystopic and horror and horror in general as well that sort of need to survive is the thing right hmm. and maybe there is something in kind of removing all of the kind the complications of the world and thinking about what do people do because they are still about people do when when survival is the only goal which always feels a little bit again it's that fatalism i don't know if you've seen the last of us mm, played no, the game. bits of it yeah yeah and all sorts of things around zombies and and those kinds of dystopias where what, and the decisions you make when literally you just have to survive yeah mm. it's pretty grim as well isn't it, it is. <laughs> but it's just so fascinating mm. um i think it's yeah the thought experiment of working through what do you what what will people do um, what could the world be like? Mm. Um, what are the potentials of that? What are the positives? What could it work out like? But yes, unfortunately, most of the time I'm always like, okay, what is the worst thing that we could do with this? Or what is the way that someone could corrupt? What would be a genuinely good thing? Because <laughs> maybe I'm very cynical about the world. Well, it didn't sound like you were cynical to begin with when we ta started talking about AI and you said, you know, yeah. there's no need to be worried about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I like the, the um, I'm a weird juxtaposition of like incre incredible cynicism and incredible optimism about these things. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that's part of being human as well, isn't it? The contradictions and the yeah. juxtapositions that like you say. <laughs> Should we talk about your, your latest <laughs> Should we talk film? About <laughs> yeah, talking about the grim features. <laughs> For people who are watching on video, because this might actually end up on Spotify eventually if I ever get my arse into kit. <laughs> at the moment, it's YouTube only. <laughs> there is a poster I'm holding at the moment of uh, Max's latest film, Standing Woman. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, let's talk about Standing Woman. <coughs> and again, thinking about that idea of taking something that could be a positive and <laughs> spinning it on its head. <laughs> um, so this is an adaptation of a short story by um, Yasutaka Susui, who's a Japanese writer. Um, and in the short story... It's set in a world where instead of people being um, put into prison, imprisoned for their crimes, um, they're planted in the ground and they turn into trees. <laughs> so it's kind of a green... I saw the trailer and I got the gist of that from it, but I didn't realise it was instead of going to prison, that's what happened. So it's a green initiative. <laughs> um, a way of kind of making things, you know, like we're going to put back into society and yeah, nature yeah, yeah. and oh, all nice. these things. But folks yeah. don't come back from being turned into trees so it is ultimately a death sentence but they're still living just as a different kind of entity so can they still talk and stuff no oh they they will eventually just become be a trees. tree yeah. i see but it takes a long time yeah it's not a, it's not a quick process right <laughs> <laughs> what's the <laughs> Do they just get planted in the ground to begin with then? I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I saw the, in the... sort of public places almost as that kind of a warning to others. Oh, so it's sort of like being in the stocks as well. Yeah. That kind of idea. Okay. So what starts out 
as imprisoning people who have committed crimes very quickly becomes a way of the government taking control of people who are dissenting voices. Mm. And so in the short, Tom is a filmmaker. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. He's, um... <laughs> and that's why, you, <laughs> that's why we're here today. <laughs> yeah, we need to talk about things, Tom. <laughs> um, the main character is called Tom. He's a, he makes the sort of propaganda films for the government. Um, and he, his wife has been planted kind of for standing up for his creative ideals. Now, in the original short story, um, he's a writer, not a filmmaker. Um, so that's one of the shifts for the adaptation. But the same, his wife has been planted into the ground um, for being outspoken and standing up for him being creative, like for his creative freedom mm. and for people being creative and for their own, you know, and that at some point it will be dangerous for folks who are creative to they'll lose their voice they'll still have to just say what the government wants them to say mm -hmm. um and so it's their sort of last interactions as she is turning into a tree oh right and that's so what the that's short the film short is based on that real kind of poignancy of that moment <coughs> of there is no way out of it for them but they're you know they have to sort of come to terms with it um so it's not it's not a happy short <laughs> <laughs> it's a really interesting concept though but it's and the trailer looks amazing it's a well. fantastic concept mm. um i read it when i was um in tokyo doing some research as part of my phd so i spent three months in tokyo thank you to the japanese society for the promotion of science <laughs> um for sending me out there to interview japanese writers about their process mm. um and i read the short story and thought it was fantastic and immediately just wrote of i could see how i could adapt it to work for a british context right um, and so I did that. So this was a purely sort of a passion thing. This was just a fun, I wrote it like not to make or anything like that, but just as a, a kind of exercise of something I did one evening. Did you contact the author? Um, okay. So that's, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just did that for the, for the heck of it. Yeah. Cause it was fun. Um, I sent it to, um, Tony Hipwell, um, who's a friend from the York filmmaking community, just as a sort of like, I bet you'll enjoy this. Um, to, at which point he was like, do you think we could make this? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> we need to get the rights. Um, and thus two years of pursuing really? the rights for the project, which we eventually managed to get, um, mostly because I'm tenacious and annoying. <laughs> and I just kept emailing um, really? the publishing company, Kadokawa. Were they ignoring you? or were they No, just... they were very polite, right. but also like... Go away. <laughs> you can't afford this and like yes we would like to pay no money to you <laughs> to adapt this film um sisui is quite a famous writer right. in japan um if you've seen anime mm -hmm. um the film paprika okay. is based on a novel that was written by yasutaka sisui right um as is the film the girl who let through time okay so he had some very high profile <laughs> um and there's a lot of live action but you know i'm an anime geek so i only know the anime stuff um but yeah so we just i just kept emailing and eventually some poor person at the other end said if i could get a letter to him in in japanese that they would pass on the letter to the author and if he approved it then we're cool Right. And I was like, yep, that's fine. I have many friends who are Japanese. Oh, good. <laughs> I will get this letter to you. <laughs> ah. um, and we did. And he said yes. Wow. Um, and then the author is involved a lot more in the um, project on contracts in Japan. So we had to send him a version of the screenplay also translated. Oh, my word. To approve before we could make the film. So that required more favours from your Japanese friends. <laughs> Was it all favours? Yes. No money exchanging hands. And this is... I know, it's a miracle, you. really. It's quite remarkable that you've managed to do this. It's like, thank you, Miyuki. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Miyuki, who sat across from me while I was studying for my PhD. Oh, right. Um, and who has done quite a lot of translation work for us right. on that. Um, so that, that was very helpful. Um, also... I've never had my language choices scrutinized so much as having someone translate my work into another language. In what way? So asking me, like, when you use this phrase, what do you mean? Because within the context for a new language, it, I could use this or I could use this. What did you actually, what was the root of why you chose these words? Wow. Um, and 
because they sounded pretty is not a good enough choice. But that is sort of a choice sometimes when you write, um, and you know, maybe using alliteration, for example, yeah. or just kind of the rhythmic up and downs of things. But that's yeah. not going to translate, like you say, into a different language. Necessarily. No. So you're starting to think of like, OK, well, I did like the sound, but what did I like about the alliteration? of it? What do I like about the sound? What am I trying to convey here? Wow. <laughs> that sounds like a massive task. It's really fun, though. <laughs> <laughs> And yes, I've never really thought about my language choices quite so much as in that moment. So you probably learned a lot from having it translated into Japanese. That was really interesting. Um, nice. But we did that, went to, and then we went into the production. So you, um, the director, Tony Hipwell, um, kind of put together a really fantastic team. Uh, Yeni Sitzlia, whose name I've just butchered, sorry, Yeni, <laughs> is a Finnish um, female DOP who we'd all worked with before as well. Um, Bethan King was the production designer. Um, and, you know, quite a lot of other folks involved. We really wanted to kind of keep the Japanese nature in some elements of this. So um, I was very lucky through a friend who I also met at the University of York <laughs> um, to be put in touch with a female Japanese composer who wrote the soundtrack for the film. Mm. Um, that was Sekiko. Um, and so that was really interesting. When we came to cast the project, that was really difficult. So we wanted to have an actor who was Japanese. Um, initially, the male character of Tom was British Japanese, but on our budget and with our constraints, we couldn't find an actor in the at that point who was male and British Japanese or Japanese. Um, and we didn't want to do that thing that other people do, where they cast like a Chinese British actor <laughs> as a Japanese character um, for that sort of cultural integrity to the project. Mm. So we found Yuri Naka, who um, is who plays the character of Mari in the film, and she was so fantastic. We're like, okay, we'll switch the character. <laughs> so we'll have the character of Mari being played by um, a Japanese actress, act, female actor. That's the right terminology now, yes. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and, um, and then we found Ant <coughs> Anton Thompson, who plays um, Tom, to be the kind of that partnership. And that worked really well. All right. Fantastic. Um, so really trying to kind of stick with that Japanese feel. So we wanted to continue the flavor of it um, when we were looking at kind of sort of how it would be filmed. There was a lot of thinking about Japanese cinema and things. Could we bring things into that? Right. into the project as well as well as it being shot in um in yorkshire <laughs> with, a say ruined, Japan for a second, then. <laughs> with a ruined castle in the background and it's just yeah it's really like it it's got a really interesting vibe to mm. it i can't wait to see it so the trailer at the moment is on vimeo if anyone wants to watch it i'll and put a link somewhere cool <laughs> and the film is available on youtube fully it's um distributed by alter um which is a horror um streaming platform on youtube oh, amazing cool I'll look out for it then. I might watch it. I guess you have to pay. Mm -hmm. oh, you don't? It's free. And no way. it's only 15 minutes long. Right. I thought um, I thought you'd have... Because it's doing festival run, isn't it? Soon? We've finished our festival run. Oh, now. you have? Oh, sorry. I didn't so realize we've, that. We've completed it earlier this year. We ended up in around 40 festivals. Wow. Which is pretty cool. Mm. Won a few awards as well. Did you go to any of the festivals? Uh, Fright <laughs> Fest. Mm. That was really great. So that's in London. Mm. Um, we went to one up in York, which was really fantastic. <laughs> like <laughs> um and tony went out to the states for a couple of festivals um so yeah we played all over the, the shop there was also a re because this um completed during the pandemic we had a couple of virtual quite a few virtual festivals mm. um fantasia international film festival which is a canadian festival uh, for the fantastic film for fantastical film um had a really nice sort of um, digital platform where they'd made almost like sort of old computer graphic style avatars that you could walk around a little environment with and things like that. That was really neat. What was that for, sorry? Uh, Fantasia, for the film festival. Oh, right. So just for the film, for the oh, screenings I see. You just and walk filmmakers. Around. They made like and a you game. And you could have little chats and things. Oh, and clever. It was, that was really neat. Like Pokemon, like the original Pokemon. Yeah, like the original Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Hi, how are you? <laughs> yeah, which is really cool, you know, because you lost out on that experience of going to yeah. the festivals. Although I, as an introvert, I don't mind not going to the festivals. <laughs> cool. Um, so did you grow up in York, I'm assuming? I did, yes. <clears throat> what was your childhood like? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, what, what I'm getting at really is what led you 
to end up where what you do now and all that sort of stuff did was your childhood immersed in storytelling and reading and all that sort of stuff yep. as well and so um my parents <coughs> like to wheel out to embarrass me constantly um a wonderful home video of me at about the age of three pottering around the garden um talking clearly making up my own sherlock holmes story <laughs> Um, and you just keep hearing little bits of me being like, said Dr. Watson in a loud voice as I try to get into the greenhouse, which I know I'm not meant to be in because I look back at the camera in a real cheeky manner of like, <laughs> oh. Um, is so, hang on, is this video online? Can I link to this as no, well? No, <laughs> you cannot link to this. <laughs> but um, yeah, so my, my dad is a huge reader. He reads a lot um, and also watches a lot of films and television. So... I've always been immersed in story, so lots of childhood being left in the... <laughs> that was a funny sound. <laughs> Excuse me. That was the tea going down the wrong way or something. <laughs> uh, um, so what was I saying? So a lot of that... So a lot of my childhood was spent going to the library um, and reading everything in the library in the children's section and then dad being like, okay, which book's... Uh, safe for you for me to take out from the adult section for you to read <laughs> um and watching a lot of films that i probably shouldn't have watched when i was really young because my parents just didn't care <laughs> did so much is this okay yeah it's probably okay um <laughs> yeah. i let my daughter watch like the first few minutes of um uh, wednesday recently you know the netflix yeah. series uh, although i skipped through the bad bits because th the very start of it is where the piranha fish i don't know if you've seen it yes i have jump in the swimming pool yes. yeah, in the swimming pool and that bit so i skipped through that bit because i didn't want to give her nightmares how old is she she's six. Oh yeah but she's... You, you see my parents would have just let me watch that <laughs> really <laughs> wow i mean i got in enough trouble as it is just for doing that from you know her mum, and then she went and told everyone at school and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i've watched wednesday and then they all went to their parents charlotte's watched wednesday and it's like oh god <laughs> What have I done? <laughs> I mean... <coughs> so they would have let you watch that sort of stuff at that sort of age, would they? Hmm, really? Yeah. Did you, did you think that affected that, you in any way? Did you have nightmares? Yes, why do you think I write all of these things and I, I don't have nightmares about any of this It's stuff. you trying to deal with your inner psyche. And your <laughs> <laughs> no, I watched a lot of stuff. Um, mm. Yeah, I was really into things. I mean, you know, uh, Young Sherlock Holmes. You know this film? No fantastic played by children no oh. well yeah there's yeah there it's like what if watson and sherlock met at boarding school oh, okay and solved a crime involving like ancient egyptian cults right. in london there's a lot of people being boiled in like alive in oil and some cream cakes come to life in a hallucination <laughs> it is not a child-friendly movie although it is a children it's not a high rating it's an 80s movie yeah. um, <laughs> so i watched a lot of stuff like that when i was quite young right. um and then, and yeah, I was just reading all the time. Mm. Um, my dad really wanted to get a PlayStation when they came out. I was about nine at the time. <laughs> and he want, he really wanted one. So he just kept being like, you know how you love Indiana Jones? You should talk, you know, this is like female Indiana Jones, but you get to play the character. Um, as in Tomb Raider. As in Tomb yeah. Raider. So he was like, there's this game, it's Tomb Raider. We, this is like female Indiana Jones. So, we got, to, so we, we got a PlayStation when they first came out and we played as a family. So I would do all of the puzzles and the jumping and the agility stuff because I was younger and could mm. do. And my dad would do all the bits that involved killing of various endangered animals <laughs> and people um, <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. Um, so gaming was sort of a family thing. That's quite nice, isn't it? A nice way of because I don't think anyone, except for the Nintendo Wii, I suppose, which is quite a family thing, yeah. isn't it? But other than that, it's quite an isolated solo. It's a, yeah, it's, and, and now I'm like, I don't want to play video games with anybody. I enjoy my solo horror gaming and that'll do. Oh, you still play video games now then? Mm, yes, oh, definitely. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I've just written an article for an academic journal on a video game and that's kind of cool. <laughs> what was the video game? Um, Fatal Frame. Okay. So there, it's a Japanese horror game from the early 2000s um, where you your weapon is a camera. So you take pictures of ghosts. Oh, I see, right. And um, you take pictures of all sorts of different things and it's like that give you clues about the environment. So you're trying to figure out a horrible thing happened in the past and has trapped an area in some sort of repeat, repetitious loop of evil. <laughs> and so your character is lured there by accident <coughs> or whatever, or design <laughs> to sort of understand what has happened in this community um, to then piece together 
the ritual, usually ritualistic thing that's happened and mm. to then complete the ritual correctly to sort of put everything to rest, usually with some form of sacrifice for themselves. Right. Um, but yeah, you go around to take some pictures first. Yeah, the best, if you can line up your <laughs> shot properly and everything like that, you, you're, you know, it creates more damage for the, for the, for the nasty ghost that's trying to kill you. Right. Um, <laughs> but there's a huge set of them. They just released, did a re-release of one of the games in March. So last are, are you playing on PC or console? Uh, PlayStation. PlayStation. So as in PlayStation, the, one as of the in, newer ones. Yeah. PS5 or whatever. <laughs> um, so you, what are we on now? I don't know. We're Is on it? five now. I yeah. don't have a five, much to my chagrin. <laughs> um, they're really expensive. Yeah. So I'm still playing everything on the four. Right. But um, this is a 2000, early 2000s game. But the game, early so 2000 game, I have a PlayStation 2 also, which oh, I do? have cracked back out. For wow. This. Yeah. I mean, I had the original PlayStation. I used to love those, you know, the circuit to press the button and it yep. pops up. And <laughs> I know, right? We, I mean, I still have one of those at home somewhere in a lot and then I'm like locked away. Um, but yeah, always, I think because I enjoy the, because um, I really got into playing the Japanese horror games, I was more of a <coughs> PlayStation person than an Xbox. Mm. Not, what, what about Nintendo? Have you ever gone on to Nintendo? No. SNES or N64? No, we couldn't afford any of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we've got an Xbox, um, what is it, 360, I think? I barely yeah. use it anymore. No, did you we use the one. game? I was never, I would never, no. <laughs> I was never really what you would call a gamer, I don't suppose. I mean, when I was younger on PlayStation, I used to play football games mm-hmm. and get really frustrated, like be one of those kids. Why? Ah! <laughs> like screaming at the TV, <laughs> throwing my controller across the room, that oh sort dear. of stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I take it you don't do that then? <laughs> Strange enough, no, but I'm mostly like, ah. <laughs> Um, although I do, yeah, I mean, there's that point where you're like, I've been playing this for too long. I'm making stupid errors. I need to step away now right, right. and go back to this later. I think part of the frustration when you were younger with the games like that, is the save function wasn't as good as it is now. You yeah. Can just, you can just turn your console off now and it saves it for you and you just come back to it. You know, you might be oh. one, one minute back or something. We had an Amiga and the uh, Disney Aladdin game where there was no save. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So you just played the game and you're like, I've made it to the last level and then you get killed by the final boss and that means you have to restart the entire game again. Exactly. Yeah, th- those are the days of frustration. <laughs> that was frustrating. Yeah. What's what's quite nice about those, um, the Fatal Frame games, is that they've still kept some of that mechanism in there of like the save point. Mm. So it, there are get save to the next points, but you have to get to the save point. <coughs> Otherwise, mm. you're going to need to replay things. Yeah, I quite like that. Which I like the jeopardy of. Yeah. Especially as I'm running down the hallway being like, no, ghosts! Some <laughs> some real world jeopardy, including the jeopardy. Yeah. yeah real, <laughs> real world jeopardy to yourself as opposed to just the character on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this research paper about this this game was it what was it uh, so this is in relation on? to um folk horror so the subgenre that's just kind of started to emerge i do a lot of work around genre i'm really interested in genre and boundaries of genre mm. so we've talked about science fiction and the boundaries of, of that i'm really interested in genre um and folk horror is a new subgenre of horror um that's kind of emerged from mark gatiss sort of talking about it um and um things like the wicker man um, and there's sort of work from uh, Scovell's written a book that's kind of stated some of the ideas of like, what is folk horror, this chain of events or this set of items that kind of, if there's a film or a TV series or something that might have these, it could fit under this category. So I'm looking at the game from that point of view, but also looking at kind of gender and how gender plays into this, because it's quite interesting. You've got female characters who have the power of the camera and they're choosing what to witness, what to see, um what to observe and perhaps the male gaze is often quite voyeuristic but it's a woman who's doing that on the other hand the third person perspective of this game is very um (laughs) yeah there's a lot of camera angles that are quite low or quite high as your scantily clad female character wanders the environment (laughs) well that's what tomb raider was like as well wasn't it yeah um so they're not quite as emancipating (laughs) And it has that interesting kind of contradiction in it. Um, but the antagonistic characters are often female within this environment as well. The main kind of boss 
the the main antagonistic force, but they're usually because of something that's happened from a more patriarchal society point of view to them that's kind of returned. And there's quite a lot of, interestingly, Japanese folklore that these games play into some of these traditional tales of female ghosts who come back for revenge on those who've been uh, that they've been wronged by, right. um, which ties into sort of traditional folklore. So it's got that kind of rooting within it. So yes, yeah, sorry that went off on a rumble. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not so. They're really fun. Um, <laughs> yeah, I do enjoy that. Um, and sort of thinking about kind of folk tradition and how that manifests itself now. Um, I'm interested, as I said, in the blurring of boundaries. So thinking about, could you do something that has artificial intelligence, but also might fit into some of those ideas of folk horror? So mm. I've been writing a script for a while that's this research script that I'm still wrangling with mm. <clears throat> that has that, well, you know, the, the language of computers, the language of coding, is that not kind of, that not everybody knows it. We use things, but we don't all know how the code works or how to program. And is that not also like kind of perhaps the Latin that kept people out of the um, sort of mass and things like that? Oh, I see. So you, is it its own kind of cult, could you say, around that? I'm looking at kind of thinking about the kind of a lab within an academic context, which has its own cultures and traditions and a skewed belief system might develop from that, which could create an AI. And would that be figured in the way that we might think of something beyond the veil, supernatural veil of reality, as in like a god or an entity, but also could that be beyond the kind of normal world of programming and having something that exists within the Wi-Fi around us. So yeah, I'm doing something with that at the moment, which is kind of fun because it's that like, how do you blur? I can't, can't get my head around everything. Yeah, you just <laughs> sorry. There. But no, so so so, so pe you're saying suggesting that people who know how to program and understand that language, that's like a a kind of a, a well, you said a cult, didn't you? Mm. So it's a group of people who have this ability that other people don't understand, and and the things that they produce from that sort of control us all to, to some extent as well, because it's all the technology we use but we yeah, don't understand how it works. That. Yeah. Is, that, is that what you're getting at? Is that what well, you mean? Or? No, okay. <clears throat> That's kind of taking it even to the further, but just, yeah, for the context of this project, I was thinking about like the idea of if you have um, within a kind of perhaps folk belief system that there is control somewhere that people have a kind of set of text or something that they're controlling a community with. Right. But if you could take that to a different extreme and put that into a kind of more science context, mm. Could you use the language of coding to map onto that? Um, and could something that's created out of that be seen? Is that a part of the folk genre then? Is that this, this idea of like a small group of... Yeah, so it's sort of having that kind of small community that has become isolated for some reason, whether geographic or... Um, yeah, I guess... Yeah, usually geographic. <laughs> yeah. We have these people who are living in a small community somewhere and that's allowed their belief systems and understanding of the world to have become sort slightly the, different, right, yeah. usually drastically different. So have you seen Midsommar? Um, is that is that the one? Yeah, I think I have, um, where they go to sort of like so, a camp. Yeah. She wears the flowers on her head. Yes. Yeah, I have. God, that was a crazy film. <laughs> <laughs> but that would kind of fit within that kind of context of a community that's sort yeah. of slightly veered from... And The Village as well. Have you seen that film? Yeah. Yeah, Shyamalan Yeah, film, so yeah. that sort of thing. Or <coughs> you know, going back to what they call the unholy trinity within the folk horror context of the Wicker Man. Right. Um, Blood on Satan's Claw and the Witchfinder General okay. all have that kind of thing of communities that become isolated and their belief systems switch off from normal and then that allows for either a, a horrible thing to occur, whether it really is supernatural or not. Um, but yeah, there's that kind of big nasty event at the end <laughs> sort of like divide and conquer almost isn't it i guess because you know one person is often the one who's trying to keep all these people isolated so they have the control they can manipulate them to their own liking yeah so um, you are you suggesting that's what this ai thing would become is that that manipulative force or something well i was looking at more of the scientific lab in this story the person who's in charge of that lab being the one who's trying to control right. um and because I'm so sick of seeing, because <laughs> let's go back to my positive AI. I'm so <laughs> sick of seeing AI stories where the AI is evil. <laughs> Having something more along the lines of, eh, 
an artificial intelligence that just doesn't understand the limitations of the humans, nor is it able to kind of m stop itself from overloading people because we don't have the same processing power um, as an artificial intelligence. Right. So that, yeah, <laughs> there's some fun stuff to be done there. <laughs> Sounds fantastic. Um, so what, what have you got coming up? next was is that that's obviously on the on the yeah. horizon is there anything else coming up i, I saw there was a, a chat um an online is that have i got that right have i um what have i got coming up so this friday <laughs> i'm doing a talk um at the bournemouth writing festival about artificial intelligence that's what i saw online yeah I um, thought I saw that, so yeah. about ai um and how <coughs> one might use ai um as a creative writer so and that one specifically pitfalls? said ai and algorithms i noticed as well because you don't want to confuse the two yeah i know i'm so annoyed it's a bit of a bugbear of mine actually that everyone keeps calling everything ai at the moment it's like jumping on a little marketing bandwagon isn't it basically it calling feels like everything ai jumping on bandwagon but i also feel like it again it goes back to that kind of slightly panic mode because i feel like you then start to associate ai with the way science fiction has presented ai and we're immediately at skynet <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah <coughs> so I'm, I'm doing a talk at the Bournemouth Writing Festival which is at the Palace Court Theatre I'm excited to go to this new venue um, where is it? Uh, it's in the centre of Bournemouth um, it's been bought by um, Arts Uni the Palace Court Theatre yeah oh I think I heard about that yeah yeah, yeah so it looks quite interesting they're right. currently renovating it so it's sort of in stages of renovation <laughs> um, but it should be a really fascinating place um, and that's this Friday that's this Friday at 3.30. Which might possibly be, Which by the time I put be. this on, might so, be last Friday. Which <laughs> might be last Friday. Um, April the 21st. Okay. Um, 2023. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I'm doing, so that's coming up this week. Um, and then... Will that be filmed? Do you know? It will not be filmed. Okay. Unless I film it. <laughs> so you have to be there. Um, <laughs> and then... I'm just working on a few projects at the moment. So this feature film that's taking kind of science fiction and folk horror and seeing where I can smash them together. And if that creates any useful synergies or useful kind of warnings and things about the future, speaking to all that sort of stuff. <coughs> um, I'm writing a short for um, a project also within folk horror. Um, How much stuff do you write that you that you, you you start writing and then you just find actually you know I don't want to pursue this anymore or you just put it to so the side for a while many like things. <laughs> I mean, it's a world that I can't. I mean, I I do a bit of writing myself, but you sound really prolific in terms of reading and writing and just consuming media and. Well, why don't you? I mean, I just can't. Yeah, it's all <laughs> of my life, isn't it? <laughs> I just yeah, I kind of can't help myself. I just want to kind of consume as much as possible that's amazing though isn't it i think, I think it do sounds you like you're following your that? passion um sometimes but i get quite sick of it after a while i have to <laughs> you sound surprised <laughs> i don't know i don't know yeah sometimes but I also i feel like i suffer i struggle sometimes with like a addictive kind of nature of things so i i, I try to, to not do too much of things it feels like it damages my mental health if I... If you throw yourself too far down the rabbit hole of... Yeah, maybe. I, don't, I do lots of varied things instead and then they just I, I forget about them after a while if I get a little bit bored of them and just come back to them in like a year or six months or whatever. But you've been doing quite a lot of writing recently. I've written some children's books recently. Yes, you have. <laughs> have you seen it? <laughs> you showed me. Did I show you the whole thing or just the... You, I think just the... I'll have to give you a copy sometime. Yes, that would be amazing. <laughs> I mean, it's aimed at a, ch a ch child, so I don't know if you'd enjoy that much. <laughs> but no, I've, I've written like um, three or four children's books now, and they're all rhyming, sort of like Dr. Seuss or Julia Donaldson, kind of that sort of rhythmic, uh, I don't know what you'd call them, you know, the sort of four... Yeah, <coughs> how do you... I was a, B, say, a, B, I guess. How do you get yourself into the kind of zone for that? Well, that's something I actually genuinely enjoy, because it, it's not just like... Um, uh, um, I suppose writing a story has its own challenges, but I partly enjoy that because the rhyming nature of things means you not only have to tell the story, but it's also a puzzle that you're trying to work out how you can get the words <laughs> in the right order. So you got the rhyming word at the end of each line and it sort of was like, oh no, you know, and you scribble things out and you think that doesn't flow very well. And it kind of, I used to rap when I was a bit younger. <laughs> so it's sort of like that as well, you know, getting the rhythm and the flow feeling right. 
And I, I try to do it all from feeling, at least with the first draft, which is what I find fun, enjoyable. And, and then there's the, 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 the later drafts. The, the later drafts, you know, then you start tearing it apart because you think it doesn't flow as well as you thought it did when you first wrote, wrote it or whatever. But you end up rereading the first bit over and over again and up to the next bit and then you write a couple more verses and you reread the whole thing again and write a couple more to always try to feel like you understand the overall flow of it, if yeah, that makes sense. that does make sense. Um, but I don't know, honestly, I don't know. I've, I've never had any kind of formal, I mean, other than school, you know, we had, we had a uh, anthology of poems, which we had to make notes in. Did you probably have the same thing? Yeah. <laughs> but my anthology of poetry, like I looked over my neighbours and there's like maybe two notes on it. And I, I used to fill the entire page left and right <laughs> with little scribbles of what this means and how it connects to the next verse and, you know, just all that sort of stuff. Um, <clears throat> so I guess I have a bit of a passion for it. But then I, I sort of start doubting myself maybe at some point. And I think, actually, this isn't as good as I thought it was. I leave it for a while, come back to it in a couple of months time. I read it again. I think, actually, it's better than I thought it was. <laughs> so I, I have these little internal battles all the time. I, so think I think probably most creatives probably suffer from that at some point. I was going to say, that's the, is that not the pendulum swing of creativity of like, yeah. I am amazing. I am dreadful. <laughs> I am amazing. I am dreadful. I guess so. <laughs> Um, but how does that ever how do you ever cure that i mean we watched i don't the, think you ever cure that well my wife and i watched the lewis capaldi documentary i don't know if you mm, seen, I haven't it seen it but he um he struggles a lot with his mental health and he he realized that he's got tourette's um and he has this he has this twitch that um when he gets tired or anxious he starts twitching and it's caused him sort of back problems and shoulder problems and stuff what was the point i was making yeah he so he's like you know sold millions and millions of records since he first came out and then um i think he's got like billions of streams on spotify or something so he's you know a good songwriter from that perspective but in this documentary he says he actually doubts himself more now than he ever did before it's like he's he's got this expectation now that he needs to m match or exceed and if he doesn't you know he, he he's not worthy or something it's a bit like that all the time isn't it even if you're learning the more you learn the more you like become an expert in an area, the more you realize you don't know yes. about everything. Yeah, yeah. It's like that Dunning-Kruger. <laughs> Have you seen the Dunning-Kruger curve thing? Have you yes, seen that? I do know what you mean. Where you're, you're most confident before you know anything. Yes. <laughs> Which so many of the students I teach are like that in their first year. They right. sort of think they're everything, you know, it's easy, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then you start learning stuff and your confidence drops quite dramatically until you're at the bottom when you realize how big this subject is and you know very little of it and then you slowly gradually start coming up but i don't reckon you ever reach the confidence you were at before you started learning the thing no i don't or when you, you just do. i think it's just <laughs> as you start learning the thing it's like just after you start learning the thing isn't it you're like this is easy i can do this <laughs> and then there is this huge well of knowledge yeah. and information yeah. um, did you ever play command and conquer the, i did not i oh, didn't but do you know the gist of it it's I, like soldiers yeah. on a map but you start in this little circle that you can only see a little portion of the map. And as you explore, probably a lot of games use the same principle and it uncovers yeah. the map. I think of learning like that. You start as those soldiers. You're like, this is the whole world. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> and then you unveil, the, you know, and then you meet enemies. <laughs> and they're like, ah. <laughs> you're like, ah, go back to the original map. But it's too late. You've uncovered the map. <laughs> yeah, you can't go back. <laughs> yeah. It's like that. I think learning. I think actually, that's a really <laughs> fun metaphor for that. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't think, and I, I feel like you never fully, because you want something to be good, yeah, like you can never judge what people are going to think. It's so subjective. You've no idea really how that's going to speak to other people. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, I, and I mean, I, get, I gave them as gifts to friends. So I, we got one book printed, which is called There's Something in My Shoe. And it turns out the thing is, oh, well, this is the one I showed you, wasn't yes, it? it? Yeah. Is. The thing is like a little creature that somehow jumps into people's shoes. Because how do you ever get a thing in your shoe unless it jumps in there? <laughs> it makes no sense how anything gets in your shoe. <laughs> I mean, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I gave it as a gift to a lot of friends uh, for Christmas. And... Um, like some friends said, oh, it's great, amazing, blah, blah, blah. But then it's, it's almost like damaging if people received it and just said thanks and didn't really say anything about it. You think <laughs> it really plays on your mind as a creative. <laughs> Every little ounce of feedback is just, I don't know. And then I obviously got, I got, I got one good video, really good video actually from a, uh, my wife's colleague <clears throat> has got a daughter who's about seven who read it and sent me back a video saying how much she loved it. and. Aww. She said, how many stars would you give it out of five? And she said, 11 or something like that. <laughs> and that was that was almost all the motivation I need to just keep going because it might just be that that 
you know, her and people like her, that's my target audience. And the other people I gave it to, you know, don't appreciate that that's the target audience or maybe their kids are too young or too old or whatever. But yeah, it's hard. <laughs> I find being a creative a struggle at times. Do you ever... Do you ever... Yes. <laughs> but your passion sort of drives you through it. I just can't not make up stories. That's a really weird thing. And I feel like that's the one thing I find so strange... Um, Often when I talk to students, they're like, I can't come up with an idea. I'm like, coming up with the idea is not the hard part. <laughs> like, You're in big trouble. <laughs> just like, oh gosh. Like ideas are not, you know, um, I have this joke with a lot of our colleagues because we come up with stories and potentials of them like, oh, there's a short in that. Oh, there's a so-and-so in that. <coughs> Pretty much at least twice a day. Right, wow. Right, there's always something, a pattern to be found, a narrative mm. to be made. The hard work is actually putting in the like, now I need to structure this. I've got a concept. How do I put it together? What, mm. Who Who is the most interesting character to have at the center of this story? What might their motivation be? What's then the extrapolation of the world? What's then, you know, all that kind of stuff is that then that's when it starts to become the hard work. <laughs> <laughs> and then you write it like the actual script or something. And that's, you know, the edit becomes what's the most effective use of language which verb can I use instead of these seven <laughs> adverbs I've now got in here? <laughs> Which actually says more. <coughs> what's a really nice turn of phrase to get a visual into someone's head so they can understand what I'm trying to convey? And you're talking specifically about screenwriting now? As opposed talking to... about script. Or, and then if you're thinking about it from a, a prose point of view, it's always for me thinking like, oh, whose perspective is this? Is it going to be first person? Is it from one character's point of view or multiple characters' points of view? Is it third person? So that's the kind of omniscient narrator. So we're getting to go inside characters' heads, which is a nice thing about prose that you don't get with script because mm. you can't really get into a character's head in a screenplay. Yeah, unless you have the sort of narrator, the person narrating them of yeah. themselves, or whatever it is. Yeah, called. unless you've got that kind of voiceover narration. Yeah. Or you've, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> but so in a novel, you have more of that, mm. um, which is always really fun. <laughs> so it's trying to think of like, well, how's that going to work? And then who, what's the, what I like about the short stories, what I've really enjoyed about writing these short stories once a year is thinking of using structure and format in a different way. So like, um, one of them, one of these horror pieces I wrote as a guest book. So they're all entries that are left in the guest book of this property. Wow. That, so it's different characters mm -hmm. writing, like, this is what I noticed when I was on my stay or we had a lovely time or whatever. I was just getting closer to a horrible, like, a weird happening. So there's little details of stuff starting to bleed in about this environment. So wait, and how would this... Sorry, this is a... a so it's just a, a short a story. A short just, story. So I just had but it But each as, page like, is just a different entry, basically. Well, I just... I mean, it's just... <coughs> at the moment, all it is is a Word document that has, like, <laughs> right. you know, a different date. Same date, different year. But it would be presented, staying. ultimately. It would be formatted as yeah, an as entry on each yeah. page of this... Of, if oh, it was made into a book or something or whatever. Yeah. Is that how you would imagine? Just a... Yeah, like yeah. a guest book. Yeah. Um, That's a really great idea. Which which is quite fun for form yeah. um i did one like a video blog kind of you know like an unboxing sort of video thing <laughs> um one year and then one that was like a um like a monologue from a character from the perspective of a character but it's not what you think it is so i really like this idea um in japanese mythology that you there's a once an object's been around for about a hundred years, it can create like gain a personality <laughs> and gain awareness. <laughs> and I really love this idea that objects, but that be, that is influenced by the people who've used it mm. or had it in it in their possession. I think that's a really neat thing. So yeah, I wrote a horror story from that perspective. <laughs> that's a nice idea. So yeah, there's the, something <coughs> really nice which I don't think we experiment enough. <laughs> Someone Ooh. just died out there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we experiment enough with in perhaps sort of filmic form. I think we don't f think about some of the structural stuff as much. Right. Structural in terms of... The like thinking about the kind of, you know, like with horror, there's like the found footage thing, right? You know, you mm. find the camera that's had... People, awful things have happened to people and whatnot. Mm. But thinking about like experimenting with that form of how a thing is presented is is more tricky with film than with liter with them with a short story where it could be a guest book entry it could be 
you know, a code, um, you know, it could be a report. Oh, I see what you're saying, yeah. A short story could be written as a report mm. of something. The, yeah, and I enjoy being able to play around with that. And now I'm thinking, could you do it with script? <laughs> now that we're sitting Or with here. a visual film. <laughs> how do you do that with it? It's that thing of how do you do that with a visual film? Well, the vlog, there's like the vlogger type thing, I suppose, isn't there? And then the, like you say, the Blair Witch Project, the the, the handy cam. Is that what you mean? Is that, yeah, that's sort of the equivalent, of, isn't it? That's the equivalent, but there's got to be other things. Yeah, better things. <laughs> different things <laughs> maybe not better no i say better <laughs> um but that's what i mean i think there's you know sometimes what ultimately i love story mm. and i like being able to find ways of playing around with language to tell stories in different ways mm. brilliant i think we should leave it there okay. that was a very nice summary of a little ending for yourself there <laughs> uh, we need to put this up on the wall i don't know if whether to do it like live as it were do you want to I think I should give it to you and you should just... Where am I going to put it? <laughs> Anywhere you want up on that wall. There's some blue tech there for you. Look, there okay. we go. <laughs> I'm open some blue tech. This, is, this could be a, a ritual of the podcast. <laughs> ritual. I just sit here with <laughs> well, someone text. awkwardly blue text <laughs> like, like I say, you're the first one. Oh no! I put up this. I put up this poster this morning as well because I bought some posters last time. Oh, there were I'm posters in that. Subaru. Is that Stonehenge? Stonehenge. Yeah, I thought oh. it was quite nice because it's kind of localish. It is. Have you been? Yeah. Well, no, actually, I've never actually been. I've, I mean, I've driven past it several times, but I've never actually been. It's I cool. must get to the solstice thing at some point, but I don't it's know. Really, it's a really cool site. Mm. Um, but it's quite extortionate to get in there now, isn't it? If you are not a member of the English Heritage, but I oh. am one of those people who oh, is are you? part of English Heritage. I was a member of National Trust, yeah. but it's not that, is it? It's not the same thing. No, it is not. That's annoying. <laughs> um. Put it wherever you like. Such pressure. <laughs> and this is, of course, the poster for your latest film, this Standing, Standing Woman. Woman. Which you can see. On YouTube. On YouTube. Fantastic. Anything else you'd like to say before we depart? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Have we covered everything? <laughs> I don't know. Have I waffled enough? <laughs> oh, I was going to ask you actually about, you did something interesting this morning, didn't you? Costume designer, something or other. <laughs> Sorry, I know I always do this on these podcasts. I, I end and then something else comes into my head and we carry on for a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did a session. So um, one of the other things I teach here is production design. Um, <coughs> and yeah, I know. On film. On the, on film, the film course, degree, yeah. yeah. Um, so I do, I teach a specialism <laughs> on production design as well. Um and one of my sessions is run by um, Bunny Winter, who teaches costume design. So oh, I we think do I've met an, Bunny before, yeah. So we do an exchange. So I go over there and I do a lecture and I talk to her students about um, what a screenwriter is thinking about when they put together a script and how they think about character and how they think about kind of the motivations and how we use action and dialogue to convey the interior life of a character, which all the way the the kind of the thought process behind it so that as costume designers they can start to um act as detectives and unpick perhaps what a screenwriter really meant when they wrote those things when they put certain lines of dialogue created the personality of the character mm. so that they can then create the costume that will allow the actor to embody the character um and bunny comes over here and teaches like thinking about costume so the choice of costume the choice of material thinking about like do you rent something do you buy something do you make it how what does that do to the process like the production process <coughs> of it? so is she aiming that at um sort of director type students so or? we do this for the production design students right, okay. um on so ba film um has in level five so the second year their second semester they choose three specialisms right and production design is one of them. Right, I see. Um, and part of their assessment is they make a portfolio for a f script for film projects. Mm. So they have to do costume designs, set designs, um, design of props, um, and all of the kind of ancillary stuff that goes around that. So this is to get them thinking about costume. Mm. I don't think we think about, perhaps you don't think about costume and design as much because if some if a production designer and the art department have done their job well 
it's something that you don't totally notice. It feels so natural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, especially for contemporary st- design. So things that are set right now where you really don't think about it as much. You know, mm. instead the Oscars always go to the big spectacle pieces rather than the amount of work that goes into designing us. But mm. if we're thinking about sitting in here, <laughs> you know, you've already thought about trying to design. Are you talking about this? Oh, space, right? yeah. Well, sort of. <laughs> well, you know, it's randomly come up. But there are things that you found interesting that you sort of popped in there and you were like, oh, I want to put some things up. And you're right, it's a really good that idea was... to start putting up images that are related to the people who you're talking to. I'm mm, glad you think that. Um, but yeah, so it's great because she comes in and gets us to think about like your own costume, your own clothing choices. And then you're like, well, what does that say about my personality as opposed to somebody else's? And mm. then you start to think, well, what would a character wear that could reflect who they are? <coughs> Is it possible to, because um, I was thinking about this the other day, actually. <clears throat> you know, people say the choices you make in terms of how you dress and how you hold yourself and how your hair is cut and all this thing, you know, gives people a first impression. Is it possible to not give an impression? What is there do a, you mean? Is there a default? For example, if I never cut my hair, that is a choice in itself though, isn't it? Yep. There is no not choice, right? Because it also says something about who we are because we're always kind of, are we not demonstrating who we are? Because I often think, because I actually don't buy any of my own clothes, because <laughs> I hate shopping, right? So my wife. Well, isn't that a choice in and of itself? Yeah, but I guess people are uh, judging me, thinking that I am the one who's making the choices. But you made the choice to not make the choice. <laughs> yeah, but so... they don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> so it's a false judgment, but it's a judgment nonetheless, I suppose. But there would be an interesting thing in thinking about it. <clears throat> So then if you had a character that were like, okay, all of their clothes are bought by their partner, what would they wear? Then it's saying something about the partner and the partner's kind of yeah, choice of style and whatnot. Yeah. So you, and I suppose a, as I suppose children, if you yeah, say you a dress- child and the way they're dressed, then <laughs> it, the assumption is that the child was dressed by the adult, right? So then they judge the parent yeah. <laughs> based on how the child is dressed. <laughs> At what age, I wonder, does that <laughs> change? <laughs> anyway. But yeah, there's a lot of fun, I think. It's one of those elements and it's useful to think through. I feel like production design is something that's so important because it helps differentiate sometimes between student film that looks oh, like absolutely. student film and <coughs> a, perhaps a student film that doesn't, you know, that mm. has branched into it might get to the festivals and yeah. things like that. Well, I was going to say that's another reason actually that production design is probably somewhat overlooked is because you need a budget for it. Um, whereas a lot of the other things, the other el- elements of film, you can get, you can do on lower. Like, for example, there's tons of elements that make up a film, isn't there? Visual. Yeah. F- so, like f- framing and composition, for example, you don't need. You just need a camera, which yes. you can rent from here usually. Yes. But you can't rent all the costumes and stuff for free. You can't. No. So it's but much harder to. Well, yeah. I think we spend a lot of time in, in, in these sessions being like, okay, so how do we do this for 50 pence? Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Charity are, shops, I suppose, are a start, but you're still going to have to spend some money. And there are ways around it, but also it's about making, I think, students aware that money does have to be spent on this element or else it's not mm. going to work. Or you spend a lot, it's about how much time do you have, how much money do you have? Mm-hmm. So the less money you have, the more time you need to put in to say, going around and sourcing stuff of like, well, what do people have? What could I borrow? Can I borrow something from your parents that is a framed picture, for example, that could go on a wall with some command strip tape so that it looks like this room belongs to some adults who earn money. (laughs) 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 It's just the magnolia walls with like the fire exit sign in the background is the cliche student. How do we cover up the, how how are we aware that there is an exit sign? So how do we cover that for this? Or how do we frame this so that we're looking at this one thing that makes this space now look not like a student let. Mm. Um, so a lot, I feel like a lot of that, so those sessions are kind of around that of like, here are my wonderful ideals. And then, okay, <laughs> now we've had the wonderful ideals. How do we make this work? And we had some students the first year I ran this, they <coughs> re-wallpapered a section using command tape. <laughs> they re-wallpapered their, a wall. Of their yeah. house or their student Yeah, so they could have it kind of look like it had been ripped oh, and okay. whatnot. And that was really cool. Mm. Someone put down a section of floor. So they could um, create the mess. So people are always getting shot in student films. <laughs> and someone had got shot and the body and there was blood. And so they just bought some, um, uh, that sort of PVC plastic material. Mm. 
and stretched it just for the bit they needed. Okay. And, it down. and then they'd reef. That was, a, you know, they created a new floor. Yeah. That's <laughs> and it's creative. just little things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that was not particularly expensive to buy or, you know. So did it go well this morning? Um, I hope so. <laughs> how do you f- how do you feel about um, teaching as opposed to practice? Do I really you enjoy teaching. You enjoy it's teaching. It's fun. I love. Mm. It. I re. I think. I find it really energizing mm. because you get all of these wonderful creative ideas, and then you're like, "Oh yeah, I hadn't thought about doing anything this way." Um, not that every session is like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes it does feel a bit like pulling teeth, and I do teach some of the more theoretical aspects, which you know, it's trying to enthuse people into things that perhaps they're not as excited about. Um, I do a lot of teaching around practice research. Mm. So that sort of, how do you do, look at a theoretical concept in a more practical way? Or okay. my, how do you gain knowledge through making? So as I said, I did my PhD through writing screenplays. Mm. Um, and I gained knowledge through the writing of the script and the thinking through the process of writing that I couldn't have gained from just reading and watching things. Right. That, practice research is kind of around that so it's getting that concept across and being like oh could you go out and do you gain new knowledge from making something or re-editing something in a way that you wouldn't have understood mm. through just can you give an that. example of that sorry that's probably quite a tough thing to ah. expect of you um something that you learned from practice research that you wouldn't that you couldn't have otherwise or that you wouldn't have i don't think i'd have come to some of the thoughts around kind of thinking about a screenplay as a living document <laughs> As like a, because I ended up in my PhD talking about kind of the idea of the post-human screenplay. Because the script isn't really designed to, it's designed to kind of connect humans and technology in a way, because it's designed to be filmed. It's designed to be captured by the camera. It's designed to be edited through, you know, all of these things. It's a sort of conduit for all of that. So it's designed for the humans who are involved in this process, but it's designed for stuff beyond that. And and as I was putting, yeah, as I was writing the script in a piece of software that was kind of suggesting things to me and changing, you know, words and things like that, not algorithmically, just kind of spell check, I started to think about that in a way that I wouldn't have thought about just through, right? Just Mm. through reading things. Um, I know that's not a particularly good example. But that is an example, though, and then you just gain insight from the doing. Oh, because I had um, Professor Roman... Gerardimus. Do you know him? Um, Roman? Yes. So he, he said um, the same sort of thing about practice that, that is really useful for learning things. What was the other thing he said? I've just, it's lost, it's slipped my mind now. Anyway, it'll come back to me in a minute. <laughs> he said something along the lines of, um, <clears throat> anyway, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. <laughs> something to do with practice and how it's really, really useful for learning stuff. I think the actual you, doing. Yeah, that you gain um, an understanding of the topic in a, a di- it is always a slightly different way than you would have if you had actually, if you were just thinking about it in a more kind of analytical, critical way. Hmm. There's something in the creative process itself that shifts that knowledge a little bit, um, which is difficult to define. And so it is quite hard to kind of convey sometimes to students who are like, it's this thing and you do this. Um, but it, ultimately they have to go off and do the process. And a lot of, I think the way I construct my assessments kind of lends itself to that a little bit. So I get students to think about genre, but they have to write a screenplay. Mm. So they do their research around genre, but now I want them to like, well, how now take that knowledge you've got and then write a short script that might push the boundaries of it or might really kind of stick to what are the conventions, but you now know the conventions and understand them through the actual kind of act, creative act. Right. Is that, all, is that what all your research is based on as well? Practice based research? All of Mostly. Mm. Apart from the two things I've just done recently. For <laughs> so the video game is not really practice research. Oh, true. Yeah. Um, um, so I wrote that and then I've just done um, a chapter for a book. I'm hoping it goes okay of the analysis of an anime screenplay. So you, um, a script that I had translated and then sort of analysing that text. So that's more um, traditional, conventional. I don't know what word. So you had it translated is. from Japanese to English this time. Yes. <laughs> was that also a favour from a friend? No, it was not. <laughs> <laughs> no, that one was um, kind of a professionally done thing. Right. So I, I suppose um, that would have changed meaning and things subtly with the translation as well. Yeah. So they were really good at kind of leaving extra things in there and that was very helpful. All oh, right. Um, but just really interesting to look at um, an animation screenplay and see how it's set up because it is different. It's formatted a little differently. 
Um, so yes, hopefully that will come. That will come back, and I will do some edits. Um, uh, but that was yeah, that was a little bit more of that sort of analysis of something that exists rather than making. But it also made me think, oh, I kind of want to try writing things in this way, and will that shift how I like think about um, the process of writing? Is there a way of evolving? screenplay and screenplay format to now that we're in a more kind of globally connected environment where we're seeing all sorts of different things are can this thing change because the screenplay as a format is pretty it's very rigid and fixed because mm. it has to do so many different things but there are people who are playing around with it at the moment um so it's not a particularly fantastic example but Greta Gerwig's um script for Little Women is mm. in two colors so okay. the because this is a film where there are two timelines running, mm. so all the sections that are in one timeline are in one color, and all the sections that are in the other timeline are, are in another. And I was just like, that. That's, just so you can follow that's easier. That's just genius, but it's mm. really simple. Yeah. <laughs> Why are we not doing this? Why are we not teaching this for like those stories that are happening to mm. make in two timelines or parallel timelines? Is there a note on the front that says that it must be printed in color or something? Probably, if anyone yeah. ever shares it. Uh, yeah. There's something really interesting. I mean, and it does have all the like flashback to this and it's all <coughs> yeah. properly set up, but it does make it just make me think like now that we ha now that we're writing all of these things using digital tools rather than a typewriter, and how could we be shifting that script once we've done the say the master document that has the page a minute all mm. that set up to work for different people? Mm. So like if um, an actor is dyslexic does that courier font work for them or could it be in another font because it's a digital thing? Mm. Could the text be larger or smaller? Or, do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Because it is all very rigid, isn't it? You, you know, have to, what is it? Courier font 12 or something yes, you have to use? Yes, it is Courier 12. <laughs> <laughs> all has to be spaced out exactly as, as But is once that official one is done, once that, mm. that initial document, when you are... Um, moving it for various people and whatnot could it shift could it change i don't know I like it's, it's a genre a it's a in genre in itself isn't it the screenplay yes. it is a genre uh, <laughs> it's a mode it's a medium how is it of, i don't know i find yeah. genres very interesting as well i know you, you a said word, that. yeah no but genre categories i did a little bit of that in my dissertation my undergrad dissertation i, I was exploring genres um but specifically i was trying to um do you know the director darren aronofsky yes i yeah, do yeah um Black Swan and stuff. Um, I was interested to define, I think at the time, whether he was um, like a kind of mainstream <laughs> filmmaker or an indie filmmaker kind yeah. of thing. So then I think uh, Carl Rostrom was my um, supervisor at the time. And he basically just pushed me and pushed me and pushed me until the point I realised that those <laughs> those terms don't really mean much. It's very difficult to define. I think, yeah, I was going to say, we put all of these, we, we put all these categorizations down, but if you keep pushing a term to yeah, its eventually limit, it means it just nothing. means now. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Which is, which is actually, uh, I think, a, a thing that we're doing in society at large a lot with, you know, gender, for example, and various other things of which I can't think at the moment, but I feel like that's a common theme of our society is to keep pushing things at the moment until we get to some sort of conclusion and then we find it all falls apart and everyone starts freaking out and we can't really figure anything out at the moment. It's all very unsettled because we're doing that a lot. Mm. I think I think the globalisation and social media type thing is, is encouraging that. But yeah, I feel like... If you, if you say a statement, everyone will question it to death until, okay, that doesn't mean anything anymore. Or have we kind of <coughs> created folks who want to analyse everything? Maybe, yeah. I don't, I don't know if that's a good thing or, or not, ultimately. Well, we will see. It feels like we're in a transition period at the moment with all, a, lot of, a lot of things in society not really me meaning things and everyone everything's crumbling apart. Maybe AI will, AI will be our ultimate saviour. <laughs> right, we'll we... destroy her. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should stop it there yes. anyway. Dr. Max G, thank you so much for joining me today. That's I hope right. it was useful for you. It was very interesting for me. <laughs> thank you I could you talk to you all me. day, but it was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we should probably stop. <laughs> Goodbye.